Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invite to talk at WIRED. It's been a great event so far. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, also, welcome back from lunch. Now, as a um, colorectal surgeon, um, I, sort of, I thought I'd share with you the most immersive uh, experience that I've encountered in virtual reality. You see, um, I think you can see that it may be better than the real thing, but VR adds lots of immersion into our data activities. This is a picture of me uh, at BBC a few weeks ago. But let's be more serious. Let's talk about bigger problems. My last speaker mentioned big global problems. That's what I'm into. I do a lot of global health for the <coughs> College of Surgeons and at my own hospital. And I deal with cancer, a very emotive subject across the world. The Lancet Commission reported last year, in April, that five billion people do not have access to safe and affordable surgery across the globe. That's two thirds of the population. It's simple operations that could change lives. To make that more equitable, we need to produce 143 million extra operations per year and to train 2.2 million extra surgeons. By doing that, we would save 17 million lives, more than it be counted for the deaths from malaria, HIV and TB put together. We finally quantified the problem. So what are the solutions? And this is what's been taxed my mind for the past two years. There's many ways of tackling global health issues, and these are some of them. It's about planning, financing, resourcing, but also education training is where my sort of skill set comes into play, and how I think we can scale up training to a level that's going to be pertinent and reliable and efficient. And now Ben earlier spoke about NHS with innovations, fantastic work that he's doing. There's a lot of dogma and tradition in surgery and medical practice. It's hard to move the beast. The NHS is sometimes unwieldy, it's difficult. There are some pockets of innovation. We need to challenge that using technology. And my role is to translate that into clinical practice, not just saying, we have a great device, great. How do we use it? How do you validate it? What's the uh, case for it? About a thousand years ago, uh, there was a surgeon called Al Zawari who was based around Andalusia, walking around the streets, writing his textbook of surgery. This was the very first textbook of modern surgery. It became the embodiment of surgery for 600 years. A written text, then translated into Latin, called the Liber Theorici. So that's about learning. We've come from a long way from paper and papyrus and, and a book. Let me take you on the journey going forward over a thousand years. This is the world that we are used to now, a complete remove from a thousand years from Al Zarari's work. We've got to work out where AR and VR exist in this world that we live in. How do we educate people differently? How do we connect people? And the world is working in a similar fashion because Google putting up balloons into the cloud to give high speed Wi Fi connection to the world, to parts of the world that are remote. That's happening this year. We have Facebook with Internet Org combining everybody. Virgin's own OneWeb. And of course, we're very touched by Island Kurdi, the boy who died on the beach as a refugee. Mark Zuckerberg has said he'll promise every refugee internet access to communicate, to connect the world, rather than being isolated and disparate. Wearable technology, where does that come into it? Well, Gartner have said this year that 250 million wearable devices will be sold around the world. That's great. What's the use of it? Well, how do we use it? How do we explain the story I'm telling you about wearable technology? Now, I used a Google Glass uh, two years ago. This is the story. This used to bother me. I'm an associate dean of the medical school. I teach and train the last 20 years. And this has bothered me. We've been training like this for years. This is Bill Roth, a, a stomach surgeon dealing with stomach operations in 1870. And there's a whole load of people watching over the shoulders trying to learn from an operation. This has been existing for many, many years. It hasn't changed. Let's go back to my own hospital, 1920. How many people can you get to operating theatre? What can you see? Well, how can you train yourself? This is not training. This is just by diffusion, isn't it? I'm here in the operating theatre. This surge is amazing, and I've learned so much by being in his, in his presence. That's what they tell me every day, of course. But largely, it's not true. Our, our trainers deserve better. They pay £8,000 a year for the privilege of being in operating theatre. We used Google Glass two years ago as a streaming device, simple device. You can watch points of view. We have the software attached to it so that students around the world or anywhere could have a smartphone, watch the operation from my eyes, text a question, it'd come onto the glue glass, I could answer them at the same time. I could teach not one person, not two people, we could teach 14,000 we taught in 140 countries, 132 countries, 1,100 cities, all in one go. You're scaling up education, you're making it more measurable, you're making it more efficient and useful. This is our technique, we operate live, yeah, you've got, it's still a bit crowded, 
you have a glass or a wearable technology of some description, students can be in the same room watching the operation rather than being trying to look over your shoulder or be in the back of the room. This is our soft, this is our package for education e-platform. Two glasses, surgeon assistant, great views as you can see, and the only students are on the back. This is better than what we've seen before, I'm sure. A chat box, talk to one another, communicate around the world about peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. They can teach themselves, and peers teach much better than we do, as was demonstrated this earlier, this morning. So that's where we go, and this was the um, heat map of the operation. As you can see, the whole world was covered by simple operation, connecting the world that we live in, saying we can teach you in, in vast numbers, gaining up the whole of technology. This is the picture from the Lancet Commission. These are the areas that we don't support well enough. We need to make sure they work. Compare the two. Oops, let's go back. OK, that map and that map. It's providing a solution. Lancet said, this is the problem. Go and provide solutions. Here we are. A simple device can suddenly penetrate that market almost universally. I was lucky enough to, this is John Scully, the CEO of Apple. Yes, the guy who sacked Steve Jobs. Um, I managed to train him to do an operation uh, remotely. A 70-year-old man. Actually, he wasn't bad. In fact, if the truth be told, he's better than some of my trainees, but don't say it too loudly, in the age of 70. But yeah, he gets it. He understands global health. He understands connecting people, OK? And actually, he get, understands the concept. If you want to hear about the whole Google Glass story, please go to TEDx Talk. You'll hear about the ins and outs and all this sort of the sort of the parts that I haven't spoken to about today, about that whole project and how it worked. The other thing that I am passionate about is training simulation. Simulation needs to evolve. We've got to a stage where simulation currently is based on uh, laptop platforms, quite, quite expensive kit that costs about £100,000 at a time. Okay, We can't afford that. It can't be scaled to the third world or what we call lower middle income countries. So how do you create simulation that's vital, that's different, that's getting more immersive and much more useful worldwide? Could it be that a simple device like a smartphone and the Google Cardboard could be an answer to some of the problems? Could it be that simple? It's going to be a low cost approach. It has to be low cost. It can't be expensive. How do you penetrate the other countries? So I invited the world two weeks ago to our operating theatre again. You think I might have learned for the first time, but I thought, hey, I'll do it again. So come to our operating theatre, 14th of April. We said, fine, it's called VR in OR, virtual reality in the operating theatre. We created an app. You can literally three clicks, and you can all download the app, by the way, on App Store, Play, and of course, on the Samsung Gear VR. We uploaded the whole operation just this morning, so you can all watch it live, or watch it in VR. Three clicks, and you're in. Put immersive headset, Google Cardboard, everyone's got a smartphone, apps free, Google Cardboard costs about $5. Suddenly, the world becomes a much simpler place to teach and train people on a global level. Our own hospital, I managed to persuade the Bart's Health, the biggest trust in the UK, to innovate. They, they're with me. They say, fine, Shafi, we'll go with you. What do you want to do with this? They bought with 600 headsets. A hospital, so fine, get up to the staff. Let them engage in innovation. Let's push the boundaries. We'll follow you if there's problems, we'll deal with it. Of course, we went through mitigation risks and we looked at everything, make sure we're careful with governance. But they immerse, they're great. So Ben, Bart Seth is a great innovating hospital. Please uh, support us going forward. This is the app, this is how it works. That's the VR and OR. You click once, twice, and you're into my operating theatre live immediately. Put into headset. And then you're around me. You immerse you around the operating theatre. You can see the anaesthetist reading the newspaper, the surgeon operating, the assistants around the corner. It's about teamwork. We're obsessed with technical skills. Actually, it's about how, how the team works together. When things go wrong, how do you behave? That's what surgery is all about, not about the technical ex uh, exercise. So this is what you see. So please download the app. Have a go. Tell me your feedback and what it does. We had great feedback from this, by the way. This went worldwide, OK? These are countries, just for a small fractional example, of people watching the operation, trained surgeons and trainees in Dhaka, Bangladesh, a poor country, part of DFID, um, countries of high expectancy. My trainees from Fajr, Italy, who may be here in the audience, they've turned up today. <coughs> Tanzania, just a smartphone, a box, middle of just a small connectivity, 3G is what we needed. And Gaza. I've been to Gaza a few times. I'm trying to raise the profile of the medical establishment and train them. It's a difficult country. This is where it becomes over politics. Forget politics, there's a place where no one can leave or come in, it's hard, it's difficult, restraints. They loved it, they freed their minds. They said, thank you for doing this for us. We feel part of the world, we connected with people, you've trained us around the world, and we're happy, we feel free, despite our restrictions. So it's above politics. Technology can make things work much better. The Chinese absolutely loved it. About a minute before the operation, they phoned up and said, look, 
we love this. We want 1.2 billion to come in. Our servers weren't that great. We thought, hey, careful, we're okay. They loved it. Half the people watched were from China, and they wanted to be a special um, operation for them alone because they really understand technology and how it will help the whole of China going forward. I can't read the Chinese, but I think it says virtuality in OR, probably. <laughs> if you look at what it says here, all right, this is 142 countries, um, 4,000 cities involved. 4.6 million people reached through Twitter for one operation, okay? 55,000 downloads, a whole lot of views on YouTube, just in the one day. So imagine that scaling up technology and education. It's real, it's viable. You've just got to make it, work, make it work, make it more efficient. What about the future? Well, look, my vision is the virtual surgeon. Wouldn't you like as a patient to have someone who's trained on a virtual uh, uh, patient? You immerse yourself. You put your headset on. You've got a body in front of you. It's not real. It's virtual. You pick up a blade because you've got haptic feedback coming in. You can cut. You can feel the cuts. You create bleeding. You pack it. You stop it. You do the operation. Surely that virtual simulation with the most explicit yet and the best simulation that we can achieve. And all this will be developed as the virtual surgeon goes forward. That's what my company's been working on for the past couple of years. It's all going to happen. What about the long-term future? Well, we talk about singularity. Ray Kurzweil talked about singularity, the point at which robots will overtake human behavior. 2045 or 2030, whatever, it's going to happen. Can we replace the surgeon with a robot? Absolutely, at some point. It's way off yet, but that's what I term the surgical singularity and was the, talk, and was the title of my TED talk a while ago. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are unique here. We have a wonderful NHS system. It's the best health service in the world. We're fantastic. We love it to bits because our patients are so wonderful. They work with us. They forgive us when things go wrong. They help innovate. And I'll say thanks to a couple of my patients. Roy Porfer, who's a patient who allowed his body to be streamed live on Google Glass around the world. He didn't mind. He said, Chuck, I'm with you. Do what you want. I'll support you because I think you're OK and you've got done the right thing. So they understand global health. They want to help us develop it. James Watson, he had the operation two weeks ago. This was the day he went home after seven days of a cancer operation. His family really understood. They wanted to help the, the BME community in the country to raise the cancer profile and around the world. He said, fine, they understand. As long as you take them on the journey with you, they'll accept you and appreciate what you're trying to do and understand the global implications of what we're trying to do. We go with headsets to schools. We say, schools around the country, please phone us. Write to us, Twitter us, uh, tweet us about why you want headsets. Why do you want your students to learn? These are school children. 16, 17, maybe with aspiration to do medicine. We've got a lot of feedback. We've got headsets to a lot of school teachers around the country. This is one that touched me a lot. I think this is the reason why I've got to persist and the reason why I go to these lengths to train people around the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shafi. So, um, you're clearly an early adopter, <laughs> and you like experimenting in a constructive way with the toys. Um, but as we've heard a bit, sometimes big established organizations are quite slow to adapt. How long do you think before technologies like VR are an everyday part of surgical training? I'd like to say tomorrow, but clearly that's not the case. I think you're right. The problem we have is that it's the penetration. You have enthusiasts, you have pockets of excellence in the NHS and training. But actually, I think with the current sort of drive with Simon Stevens, NHS chief exec, with innovation coming in, having a, a system in place, that translation is going to be much quicker, I think. So I'm actually more optimistic that we can achieve that within the next two or three years. Because I think um, it, it's just the, it's the next continuum of education that people are looking for. I think it'll happen. And what's the downside, the limitation of using technologies like this in education in particular? I think that we, it's about the validation. Um, we don't know what's going. We don't know the, the role of it. We don't know how good it is. We have no idea. That, that's not to stop you doing these things. You'll validate as you go along. You'll take your team with you, work out what experiences are, and learn from those experiences. So validation will be the key going forward about how that education will be of value. Well, you're one of these people between disciplines, and that's where innovation happens. Thank you very much, Shafi, for joining okay, us. Thank you.